Yama, Kia Ora, hello and welcome to Meet the Creators at Afters and Acne. Nea Amy Tunig, Gamilaroi Inar. I'm Amy Tunig and I'm a Gomori woman. And I am so excited to be talking tonight with two phenomenal, incredibly talented filmmakers about their film, Cousins. Joining us tonight, we have Ainsley Gardner and Briar Grace Smith. Kia Ora, Ainsley and Briar. Kia ora. To begin this evening, I must begin by, of course, acknowledging country. Tonight, I acknowledge that we meet on the unceded lands of the Gadigal and Bidjigal people of the Eora Nation. I acknowledge that storytelling has been taking place on these lands for time immemorial, and I extend my deepest respects to elders past and present. I extend my respects to any Indigenous peoples here tonight, and of course, to the lands where you are all streaming this event from right now at home. I also extend my respect to our incredible Māori Bawa's sisters here tonight. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko pūtaua ki te maunga, ko mātātoa te waka, ko rangitai ki te awa, ko Ngāsi awa te iwi, ko Ainsley Gardner tōku ingoa, he uri no Ngāsi Pukiao me whakatohia me te whanaua apanoi hoki, he mihi nunui ki ngā tangata whenua o te whenua nei, ki ngā tangata Gadigal, me ngā tangata Bidjigal, o o te iwi i ora tēnā koutou katoa. I'm Ainsley, kia ora. Kia ora, um, ko hurui ki te maunga, ko ngāpuhi te iwi, ko ngāti hau te hapū, ko whakapara te marae, ko whakapara te awa, ko te ihi o nehua, te whari tūpuna, ko Briar Grace Smith a hau. Kia ora, I'm Briar and I'd like to also extend um, my respect to the traditional owners of the space that we're gathered in, the Gadigal and the Bidjigal people of the Eora Nation, um, ngā mihi nui, ngā mihi aroha ki a koutou. If you would like to know more about Briar and Ainsley's bios, they are up on the Afters website. The film Cousins is already on screens in New Zealand, but it will launch here in Australia this Thursday. Let's have a quick look at the film trailer. the privilege of a pre-screening this week and just watching the trailer oh, I just get emotional it's such a brilliant film 
Now, I have so many questions about this wonderful film, and I'm sure that you will too. So if you would like to send your questions through, we will have time for Q&A later, and the link is on your screen. Now the good bit. <laughs> Briar, as the writer and co-director, I wonder if you could start us off with a brief overview of the film. What should Australian audiences expect? So the film um, is an adaptation of the novel by Patricia Grace of the same name, Cousins. And it's a story of three cousins who spend, I guess, together a very brief time together um, in their childhood. And then one gets um, taken by the state. And it really just talks about um, for the, how the journey of the other two and how that goes um, without her and the, the ramifications of her not being there on the rest of the extended Sano. Um, so that's kind of without giving too much away, that's what the, what the story's about. So um, really what, what we hope, um, we really hope that it resonates with audiences here. It draws on the themes of um, family and um, the importance of human connection and of dislocation. And I think after what we've been through, and especially what Australia or parts of Australia are, are going through now, um, it's, it's had real resonance, especially at home at the moment. So hopefully um, it touches people here. It's quite an emotion story. So um, what you should expect is, or well, some of you is you might cry a bit, so bring some tissues. <laughs> <laughs> it's good tears, not, not, um, not bad tears. I agree. They were, they were good tears. I had a lot of tears, but often just from the sheer beauty of the film. Uh, so Ainsley, your role with this film is that of producer and co-director. Yeah. Cousins being adapted, as Briar said, from the 1992 novel by Patricia Grace. There were early attempts to see it produced into film that weren't successful. Uh, what can you tell us about the journey um, of you successfully producing Cousins? Yeah, at the time um, that the book was published, Meta to Meta, who was um, one of our foremost filmmakers, a Māori woman, she was a dear friend of Patricia's, the novelist, and they tried to get it made for um, 15 or 20 years. Uh, I read her script maybe about 18 years ago, and um, it was really beautiful uh, and captured the novel really beautifully, but the I suppose the systems at the time weren't really ready for a multi-protagonist story, they weren't really ready for a story where the central protagonist doesn't say anything, they didn't really understand the nature of indigenous um, storytelling, they had problems with the non-Māori characters, the white characters not being treated sensitively enough, really kind of crazy stuff that meant that we were denied the film that Merita would have made. Mm -hmm. However, and then other filmmakers also tried to make it and encountered similar problems. So because Merita was a, a dear friend and mentor to us when she passed away in 2010, I suppose there was this lasting desire for many of us to mm -hmm. fulfil the making of Cousins. And in 2015, uh, Briar was working at the Film Commission actually, and said, have you thought about doing it? And I said, and I said yes, I have thought about doing it, and um, was really conscious of the, the big shoes that had gone mm -hmm. before us. So um, what we had all of those years later was Briar and I had a lot more experience and a, potentially a bit more clout in the industry as mm -hmm. a writer, producer, uh, and we had now a, a bit more of a history of alternative narratives and that sort of thing and so we also had a new CEO, a female CEO, we'd been through the Me Too movement, there was a groundswell towards telling uh, stories of marginalised voices, so groundswell and, and momentum and I think we always talk about the fact that a film has its own life force and it was just ready to be made and we were lucky enough to be the ones to make it. We also had to, I know producers in the audience may be interested in a little bit about the structure of the film in New Zealand. We have a similar to thing to what happens here, which is a tax rebate scheme, which if your film budget is over like 2.4, 2.5 million, you can get ta a tax rebate. You, need, you can get 75% government funding, which comes out of uh, our broadcasting company, our Māori language broadcasting organisation and the Film Commission and then you need 25% private investment which we 
raised with post-production funding, really sorry for those of you who aren't producers and for whom this is terribly boring, but post-production funding, um, uh, sorry, post-production investment, equipment investment, and we were lucky enough to get tribal money. Some of our tribes um, uh, have been decimated by colonisation. A couple of our tribes worked with the government in, um, through the, the land confiscations and retained their lands, and I happen to belong to one of those tribes and they have a bit of money, so we were able to access tribal money. So yeah, the, all of those things, momentum, time was right, and we got the money sorted. Fantastic, and now we have the gift of the film on our screens this week here. Now, you may recognise Briar from the trailer, as, as well as being co-director and writer, she relinquishes, not relinquishes, takes on one of the roles as older Macaretta. Brian, can you share how you came to have this incredible combination, including being one of the actors in the film? It was an accident. <laughs> I, um, we, um, one of our very best friends and one of our most um, revered actors, Nancy Brunning, had been cast in the role of Alda Makareta. So she, she had developed cancer, but we were still working with her. She was still very keen to take the part. We were still working with her to make, make, make it possible for her to continue with the role. So we had at one point, um, she was in a wheelchair and so we had um, rewritten the script so that that character could be in a wheelchair and thought about how, how that might work in terms of even location and things like that. Um, Nancy just grew too sick and um, we all had to sort of let go of the idea of her taking the part and we had about two weeks to go before uh, we were about to shoot and I said um, sort of just sort of sighed loudly and sort of murmured I may as well audition and I used to be a theatre actor and a couple of hours later I had a tap on the shoulder and there's um, one of the casting people there with her camera ready to <laughs> film me to audition. I was like, I didn't even, even though I'd written the script, I didn't know the words or anything. So <laughs> um, I auditioned and then I got shortlisted or whatever. And she made me audition about four times, but I really didn't want it at the um, beginning, but I've got quite a competitive nature, <laughs> like quite fierce. And when I saw the other woman who had auditioned, I was like, I really want this role. And I got, I, I tried hard. <laughs> it probably worked out for everyone that you got the role. Uh, and you are phenomenal in it. Um, an absolute blessing. So as an Indigenous woman myself, something that really struck me about this film, as well as the fact that it's just brilliant, is the ways in which Māori-specific cultural acts are almost casually intertwined and included within the overarching storying of the film. So I understand that you followed various protocols uh, and, and steps to ensure appropriate uh, cultural inclusion. Um, Ainsley, maybe you can shed some light on what that looked like? Yeah, well, I think the interesting thing is that it's inherent as an Indigenous storyteller to seamlessly weave culture into story. So it's not always, it's not even by design. But I think when you're working with in a really specific tribal area, particularly if they are giving you money, there were um, conditions attached to it. We had to shoot in that tribal area in one of their um, marae or their local um, meeting houses. We had to take on interns from that tribe. We had to cast extras. The old grandmother who you see in the trailer, she's just my nan from one of, you know, from that area. There's scenes in there which are just aunties and um, local women and Briar would give them the script that she'd written and they'd read over it and say, okay, we'll come back in 10 minutes and we'll rewrite it for you. <laughs> you know, so that it was in their dialect, in their language. And, and so w you basically, the, the protocols come before anything. Uh, and as Māori filmmakers, we, we know that. So we work with the elders, to, particularly when you're looking at things like rituals, like betrothals mm -hmm. or funerals, tangi, um, that that you have to treat these things in a particular way. You have to lift the tapu or taboo of those things in, in an appropriate way. So it really just comes down to many, many we call it the ten cup of tea process. Just a lot of 
conversations about how to marry up proto traditional protocols, which include prayer at the beginning and end of every day, um, which include particular ways of keeping people safe, especially when dealing with things like funerals. Um, and you just go through a process of working out how to marry up creative desires with, with protocols. The awesome thing about that tribal community was they were so into it mm -hmm. that they were very flexible about um, how to, to, to allow us creative license and still retain, you know, retain the, um, the mana or the, the, how do you describe mana? The, yes, uh, what, yeah, the, the mana <laughs> of, of the protocols of the tribal law and rules. And Briar, did that influence your writing? Um, I just had to be on my toes because I knew it would. So when you go into an area, um, the way you, the, what you write and the way you, um, their protocol will inform the script. So with the Tomo scene, which is the betrothal scene, um, we, we worked with the community there and blocked a uh, ritual um, around that that everyone felt okay with. And it wasn't necessarily their, what they did either. It was something that we all felt mm. good about being on, on film. Oh, fantastic. Mm. So um, like that insider outsider knowledge of making sure that what goes forward mm. is what can be shared. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. I think it's that thing also, Amy, that culture is a living, breathing thing. And it's adapting and changing all the time anyway. And so it's actually, if you go in with the right intent, with the right people, um, it's, it is actually not that difficult to find the way to, for both to coexist. Wonderful. What well, wonderful messaging for budding filmmakers to, to hear and to understand the possibilities there. So the film itself, as well as the way it's been crafted, uh, is deeply relational. And Briar, your relational connection to this story is quite intimate, with the <laughs> author of the original text, Patricia Grace, being your now ex-mother-in-law, <laughs> but someone that you continue to have strong ties with. <laughs> How did you come to write the field up, film effort adaptation and what was it like knowing the original storyteller was someone you'd have that very close accountability to? Yeah, um, really interesting. I find this because <laughs> I keep referring to her as my ex-mother-in-law and I don't think that's a good title for her. She's actually <laughs> one of my best friends and still is. We see each other every week. Um, yes, that's funny. But um, so she... Um, she ended up being very kind of closely involved with the script writing process. So after um, Cousins wasn't able, in its earlier renditions, with Merita Mita as the filmmaker, um, able to get up on its, onto its feet, um, Patricia wrote um, a draft um, herself, and I was inspired by the material in there, and kind of took something out of it and kept building it up. But we used her as a script consultant, so she would read in the earlier drafts, she would read them through and sit back and feed back with me. But of course, because she was a novelist, there came a time, uh, she was very close to the material, um, there came a time when I stopped seeing her. Because <laughs> also, it, um, it was, it's really interesting too, the way novelists and script writers work. Script writers are quite, I think we're quite speedy, so we just kind of move on and novelists like to expand on detail, you know, the colour of things and the texture and mm. it's just a different way of being. But there comes a time when you just got to push, push the story through. Um, so she's always been good. She's never, she's always been easy eh, and encouraged us to do our own thing. And she came onto set twice. She came once in Wellington um, where we shot the urban scenes that you'll see. And then she came to Rotorua, um, Ainsley's tribal lands, and she was she she loved every moment of it, didn't she? She did, apart from the potatoes. Oh yes, see, there was the novelist in her. There were the potato for being peeled wrong. No, they were no. being cut in the wrong side. Oh, the cut in the wrong side. <laughs> that wasn't um, era appropriate. Yeah, and the. Uh, <laughs> And the, <laughs> and the orphanage, the sheets of the bed weren't um, folded correctly. But, yeah. you know, the camera never made it to those details. So, it's <laughs> But I tell you what, in terms of dialogue and everything in the script, um, because some of the script is shot in the 40s and 50s, it was just so wonderful having someone 
um, that had lived in those times to be able to give it um, a sense of authenticity, you know, mm. and the attitude of the characters back then. Mm. Yeah, and isn't it amazing with things like this? Like, I think sometimes people that are outside Indigenous communities, when they hear about these protocols and, and this almost policy approach that you have to take, it sounds like work, mm. but actually it's always a gift. It's a gift, yeah. yeah. And that's, mm. it, I think it really shows through, as an outsider to Māori culture, it, it really shines through in the film. Uh, so watching the film, I really enjoyed what we as Indigenous peoples of these lands would likely refer to as circular storytelling. And during our pre-chat, um, you referred to it as spiralic. <laughs> uh, are you able to, maybe for those who are unfamiliar with these terms or haven't yet seen the film, Tell us a little bit about this type of storytelling and what it means for the teller and the viewer. Um, I, I made that term up, I think, spiralic. I'm going to take it. I'm Quite putting it on things. I will cite you, but I love it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a kind of a community way of telling a story where you kind of gather. Like, um, it's not a singular, linear way of telling a story where you gather and get, gather people and stories along the way. So that's how I see it, like that. Um, with Cousins, uh, the book is written in a way which is very Māori, it's non-linear. So when we go to the marae or the meeting house, the, to the whare tūpuna, we, uh, the orators or the speakers will stand up and they'll tell you a story. They always have a point to make, they're always pushing their point across, but um, they will jump from past, then they'll jump to another moment in the past and another moment, then they'll stand in the, in, in the now and they'll keep bringing these moments together and weaving them together until by the end of what they're saying, they've made their point. So everything else that they've gathered together is for a reason because they want to make this point. So the book is very much kind of written in that way and it was something, it leaps around, but it all, at the end of it, we understand. We don't understand completely all the way through, but at the end we have quite a deep knowledge even though it's um, not quite, it's kind of up here, we don't quite get it, it, there's a, it kind of stays with you. Um, so I wanted to, in the adaptation, hold on, it was very important to me to hold on to that type of structure, so a non-linear, um, spiralic kind of structure. Um, and you know what, we did get, of course, some criticism um, about the script because of it had a different structure. Um, we still kept what we had and, of and also when we showed our rough cut to people we got some feedback asking if, you know, encouraging us to kind of lay it out in a linear way. Well we did try that, it was bo it's boring. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't supposed to be like that. Like, yep. So part of what's it, that kind of structure, that fragmented structure is in its bones and that's part of the joy of the story. Mm. Yeah, I, I just love that term spiralic, I can see that taking <laughs> off. So you both carried and contributed significant workloads to the creation of the film individually, but when it came to directing, you're co-directors. I'm sure many people would love to hear how that came to be, how it worked and would you do it again? So, gosh, we, um, we, we didn't think, I was really, I mean, I'm a Māori woman and for many of the early years of developing the story with Briar, I was racking my brains to think of a Māori woman director. Then we made a film called Wadu, which was nine Māori women writers and directors, mostly writer-directors. And I was astounded at my own kind of ignorance and arrogance to assume that there weren't any capable mm. Māori women directors because what we discovered is there were multiple. Um, but the, the Wadu experience, which, which was eight short films, was sort of like the five abstractions. We had a single shot, it's all the same ten minutes in the day around the death of a child, um, linked either actually or thematically. And what that kind of um, sh showed us was the nature of collaboration um, amongst, that, that was sort of inherently indigenous. Uh, and what we then realised in the development of the film Cousins was that after three or four years of being the two people 
doing the most development work on the script that we were the two people who knew the script and the characters the most. So um, I, I'm pretty sure Briar came to it before I did. The way, because I've worked with co-directors as a producer and it's often quite an egotistical endeavour and it often ends up being the person with the loudest voice who gets their way on the day. Um, I, I was really, or well, we were really um, engaged in how to do it differently. My way in was to um, recognise that there was one character in the story whose story resonated with me most deeply and that's the one of lost culture, disconnection from culture. Uh, and Briar had a, a character that she identified with most and, and that was the character who lives within the community. So it gave us quite an elegant way to approach the, the logistical directing, which was when, when Mutter's story was the story we were telling, which was also largely the um, urban story, then I would be the person who spoke to the crew and um, Briar would be just at my side and vice versa. And when the third character intersected our stories, then we would manage her. Um, but that's just a really logistical way of describing it. What we were really committed to was fully collaborative filmmaking, not my, not my way, not Briar's way. Um, and I think that people who don't understand the nature of indigenous storytelling might say that filmmaking by committee is like a dilution of ideas, but what we found was that if we both bring our full selves to the table and find a way to, for our visions to converge and combine, then we elevate the vision. So, um, mm. And we worked really hard every day to put aside ego, because all filmmakers have pretty massive egos despite themselves and, and we, we worked really hard to do that, eh Briar? Yeah we did. Mm. Um, and also uh, co-directing, you know, for me it was mostly an absolute joy. Um, there were times we both had our hard days and it's just wonderful where you, when you can go, I can't do this today, I'm not communicating well or Whatever, whatever is up and you know that person has literally got your back, they're right beside you, you share the same vision and um, Ainsley could step in and vice versa, we were, we were able to support each other like that and I think that was a, a real gift. Mm. Yeah, it's like raising children, I've done it alone and I'd rather not do it alone. Mm. I mean, it's just you having somebody to support you as Briar said, but also the question you asked was would we do it again? Cousins asked for it. Cousins was a project that knew that it was not a single mm. director's vision. It was a community film and so us co-directing was what Cousins wanted. So I would 100% do it again if that's what the project asked of us. Beautiful. So elevation, not dilution. What a wonderful <laughs> way to phrase that. Oh, so having adapted Cousins from a much loved book, how have you found reception from those who first knew the story as a book, now seeing it as a film? It's really interesting. So I um, have travelled, I've travelled with Patricia to uh, several screenings now um, where we do a Q&A afterwards and most of the people in the audiences, when they know she's going to be there because she's so loved back in New Zealand, um, are readers. Mm. and they're huge fans of the book and they all come clutching their books, <laughs> walk in clutching their books and then she's surrounded and does all her signings. And it's inter I think um, mostly the feedback, I haven't had any negative feedback. Um, it's different than the book but I've never, um, I think what we worked hard or didn't work hard or didn't think about but what I think we have achieved is, um, is to capturing this, the, um, the spirit and I think if you can do that when you're in an adaptation, that's, you know, that's really what you should aim for. You shouldn't let uh, the pages or what's written in a novel hold you back, hold it back from being a film. It has to be a film. That's a different kind of life. But um, I think we, we managed to capture the spirit. Because so, I've had no negative um, feedback thus far. But I haven't had much feedback. <laughs> <laughs> Well, when I, I shared this event on my socials, I had so many people, particularly people from us, were just saying, oh, I love that film, and, and um, some non just people saying, that film taught me how to see New Zealand. Mm. Like, really beautiful feedback. Wow. Um, 
So I, I'm that serious, just no criticism. <laughs> Let's just hold on to that. Um, I'm hearing you use words like spirit and bones and mana around the creation. And it just sounds like from the book through to the creation process of adapting it through to us receiving it on our screens, it's so deeply relational and connected and grounded to the earth. And I, it's, that's just such a gift. And what a gift to have you here with us tonight talking about your perspectives. Um, so the scripting of the children is so good. I have young children myself and there were so many points where I was laughing, even in serious moments, mutter, mutter, butter, like oh, just cool. things like that. I thought, oh, that's so perfectly scripted. Uh, and the casting of the children is brilliant. Can you tell us a little bit, because there's more than one child, <laughs> like there are just excellent children throughout the film. How did you cast such great kids for these roles? I mean, it's... It's actually not that difficult. It's time consuming <laughs> and there's dozens and dozens of children to choose from. Mm. And I think that's, you know, we did a, um, we did a nationwide cast, but we did uh, concentrate our search in the area that the, the tribal area we were going to use. And what you're doing when you're casting children is you are, again you're looking for the spirit of mm -hmm. the character because you can put a wig on a, on a child and you know, or dye their hair to make them look like the adult version of the character and the audience will go on that journey and what they really need to do is embody the spirit of the character so with kids you're not casting mm -hmm. kids who can act you're just casting kids who can just be and are comfortable in their own skin can last an eight hour day or what, mm -hmm. whatever who can listen who can are resilient and can kind of recover because it's grueling and it was grueling particularly mm -hmm. for one of our girls but um, yeah w the whole casting process was really a jigsaw puzzle about finding the ways in which this character for example Rachel House who's cast as some of you guys will know from Hunt for the World of People she's cast as the adult Missy and you want to find the, the um, cast that kind of embody what what she becomes and we knew we wanted her so we had to find the ones that matched her but even up until as Briar has talked about the recasting where Briar became Makareta mm -hmm. the two younger adult versions of Rachel House and who would have been Nancy had done all of their rehearsals they had done their costumes and they no longer energetically matched once we cast Briar so we had to swap them to, wow. to a week out to, to actually um, get that energetic match. So it was massive. They were very sad um, that they had to say goodbye to the characters they'd mm. been cast as. But that's sort of how you approach the casting. And same with the kids. And I'm sure we could have put the film together in probably half a dozen different ways with completely different actors. We were really spoiled for choice. Fantastic. Well, you both have incredible um, legacies already in, in the film writing uh, arena, as if you have a look at the AFTERS website, you will see from their bios. But what's up next for each of you? Um, so far out. It's, Cousins has been a long journey and I've just really, I'm just really enjoying the what I'm describing is the molecular disassemblement that happens after the filmmaking mm -hmm. process where you sort of don't know who you are and what you're going to become when your molecules get back together. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not entirely sure. I think that the Cousins process has, has really made me refocus on process and I'd really like to do some more work around how can we tell stories in a way that's different to the way we, development, development and writing is often lonely. The, the nature of the story table and a kind of Hollywood framework is not really in keeping with the way I see indigenous storytelling. So I'd like to do some kind of interesting um, process research type work. And I also, I've got, I do want to do more directing. That's the main thing I've got three teenagers I'm really into action films I'd kind of love to follow and I used to produce for Taika so I'm kind of interested in following in his footsteps <laughs> <laughs> well 
Well, as someone who has a child named after Superman, mm. I'm a bit of a superhero nerd myself, and I would be so excited to see you take on one of those roles. <laughs> and what about for you, Briar? Um, there's one project, it's a funny thing with being in, in this business, because the 10 things could happen or none, nothing. You know, you kind of, I'm just in a kind of a waiting, uh, holding zone at the moment, but I am working on things. So I'm working on a series with um, a writer called, a Samoan writer called Victor Roger, and it's a dramedy, it's a drama slash comedy, um, eight part series, and it's kind of the story of a, a woman who is in her late 40s and she has got the, she goes through a breakup and has got the emotional, um, I don't know, she's 14, she becomes 14 again. So there's that, it's not a biography. So <laughs> um, Just make that clear. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we mentioned the ex-mother-in-law, we're doing a breakup drama. <laughs> um, and I'm, I've got a, a, a project I love, which is a feature film, which I did start to work on for Ainsley to direct, and now I've, it's kind of ended up back in my hands, and it's um, kind of uh, sort of a dark, but dark, but warm, dark, but sort of a dark fable about three sisters, and I'm really, I really love that project. But it's big, these things that you love always are the hardest to mm. to bring to fruition. But, mm. Mm. Oh, well, I feel like you're both going to be blessing our screens with a lot of goodness in the future. Um, okay, so if you have any questions for Briar and Ainsley, we do have a couple of minutes left where we can throw to Q&A. And if anyone here in the live audience would like to offer a question, we've got one hand up at the back. Are you happy to go to Q&A? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, do we have a microphone or something to pass? Nope, okay, just need you to speak up nice and loud. Okay, I'll yell out. Um, I'm interested in the process of, you said several other filmmakers were trying to make this film from a book. How did you convince the owner of the, the copyright for the book and how much did that cost you in order to get it brought further forward? Um, so the owner of the copyright was Briars, is Briars' ex-mother-in-law, so we didn't have to do any convincing. She was desperate to have... Well, just diplomacy, by the same <laughs> Just love, just absolute love, and she was so... She had worked on that herself the author had worked on the project with others for so long she wanted to see it made and she was really excited to see I suppose Briar and I are kind of quite old in our industry but she was interested that what she considered some young bucks <laughs> were going to pick it up and, and run with it so um, ultimately that side of it you know it was what was really complicated was untangling all of the other people's rights the people who had um, been involved in developing it, so previous producers, production companies, the Film Commission had in many um, directions put development money into it and then when we came on board we had to take on the existing development loan which was massive so there was a lot of untangling but I think that there was a huge amount of goodwill as well both from the author and from the New Zealand Film Commission to see it made so I think we came into it at a, at a pretty, um, at a good stage. Thank you. Okay, and we've got a question online here from Reese. How long did it take to develop the script? It took about four years to develop the script. Yeah, four years to develop the script and then when we got the financing together we had uh, 12 weeks of pre-production, a six week shoot, which in New Zealand is actually quite significant. Usually films are shot for about five weeks. And then we had budgeted for a 16 week edit, but because of COVID, we got an extra four to six weeks um, because we, we were sort of languishing in our homes. And so the editor who lived next door to the post facility would go over, edit something, send it to us in our homes, which was wonderful. Um, COVID did have some, some beautiful side effects, time with family, time to rest, um, more time in the edit. <laughs> <laughs> um, do we have any more questions from this audience? I just yep. wondered if um, there were like um, there were other Maori um, 
cases are so DRT edited and, and what impact that did or didn't have on them? Yeah. Repeat the question. Okay, sorry. So the question was, um, audience member is asking if there were any other Māori D? H. 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 Heads of departments. Heads of departments. Uh, and what impact that had on development and production? So we had a, a, a big desire to do that. We had um, a, we actually had initially two directors of photography. One, Ray Edwards, who ended up being the only one. He was, he is a, he's a young Māori, this is his first film, but we also had Murray Louie, who's a Torres Strait Islander, um, who we met and love. And um, we, we wanted to extend the, the kind of flattening of hierarchy that Briar and I were doing in the directorial realm to other departments. He was unfortunately unable to quite late in the piece as well. Um, but we had a young Samoan um, costume designer. We had e either females or, or, or Māori as HODs. It's not as easy as you think. Um, and often it becomes a political act to, to choose a Māori over somebody with more experience. But you can't give somebody more experience unless you, you do that. It makes a significant difference because there are just things, particularly Ray, our cinematographer, that you don't have to explain. He just sees the world through a Māori lens and so you don't have to explain certain concepts and, and I think that that goes whether you are a female filmmaker with a specifically female gaze or an LGBQ, LGBTQI or any other marginalised community. Um, you, you often find yourself having to explain yourself. Mm. So it makes a huge difference, yeah. We've got an online question here from Christine. What inspired you both to get into filmmaking? Oh, what a great question, Christine. Mm. Do you know? Um, <laughs> I do. Gosh, um, you know, for me, I just have a love of story. And it's interesting because, you know, I've worked as an actor, writer, and now a director, and they're all forms of storytelling, and I love them all. Perhaps mm. I'm not as good or competent at, at directing or... Um, as I am writing yet, but um, it was a kind of a progression for me. I love film though, I love the intimacy of film, the mu and I feel like it can be incredibly powerful. But I could also tell you I love theatre, and I love theatre because of the thing, um, um, it being so present, and that thing where you are in a, in a theatre, and there's the audience, and there's the actors, somewhere up here are words, and there was a writer, mm -hmm but there's a spirit in the room that you can't emulate in any other medium. Yeah, so it was kind of, for me, it was a natural progression and just the story lover. Mm. Um, it happened to me for the first time when I was four, but I think a more um, kind of clear example of what I'm describing is when I was about 10 or something and we hired some videos and clearly there was no censorship and we got these, this crazy range of videos one Friday night including um, something like 16 Candles by John Hughes and um, Porky's, which is like <laughs> the precursor to American Pie, so bad. Um, Christian F., a German, a black and white German film about um, a young, a true story about a young girl who was a drug addict and prostitute by the age of 14. And I had this experience of every one of those very diverse films that I watched. I was 10 watching a German film with subtitles. <laughs> I found myself in every one of those films. I had the experience of being feeling heard and seen in these worlds. And um, that ability to um, transport yourself and others into a world that is foreign and familiar at the same time kind of ad addicted me. To it. Oh, you both speak so beautifully. You can tell you're writers and directors. Um, so <laughs> I'm just like, oh, that is just so beautiful. Okay, from Victor. Um, no, sorry. <laughs> is that Victor Briar's Victor? <laughs> is he saying something rude? It'll be Briar's. I'm gonna, okay. yeah, we're gonna <laughs> skip that one. Um, <laughs> do we have any more in in audience questions? And I will repeat them this time. Yes. Um, 
Would you consider making films not in New Zealand, or is that where you're going to stay? And if you come to Australia, can I be an extra? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Back to the original question. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we've just made a film, uh, a Canadian co-production with a um, Cree Metis um, Canadian woman called Dana Goulet, Night Raiders, which you'll be seeing in Australia very soon. Um, and we would have, I would have gone, but um, we were making cousins and also then co they would have come to New Zealand to do the sound post. Yeah, I, I love creative collaborations. Um, Personally, I particularly love indigenous creative collaborations, but I've always been a firm believer of go where the story belongs. Mm. And um, if the story belongs somewhere other than New Zealand, then I, I'll go anywhere to tell a good story. Beautiful. And what about you, Pryor? Yeah, definitely. If there, if there is a connection to the story and a reason why the story is somewhere else, and, mm. um, and especially with the team I'm working with, because I love... You know, I love the whole working with people that um, I have that connection to too, definitely. And we're always, I'm always talking about it with my mates in Australia and in Canada about that possibility. Mm. 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 I'm already, I'm just thinking like, oh, there are so many fantastic historical stories that cross <laughs> between our continents. I'm sure there are some wonderful projects begging for your particular lens. Uh, any other additional questions here from the live audience? Yep, um, we'll start with the one at the back. Um, what was the post-production process like? What was the post-production process like? Um, interest, it was interesting. One of the things we've always done, um, when I say we, I'm talking about Taika, when Taika and I worked together, is use multiple editors. Um, it's one of the times where you can really, um, where you can really reimagine the film in multiple ways. And um, so we had a really interesting process with three editors. Um, and, you know, as I said, I think we ended up with about 20 weeks of editing. The, the music was massive. We had a very long drawn out um, process with our composer because we were searching. We didn't know, Briar and I as directors, weren't kind of this is what we want this is how we want it we need this we need that we were really discovering the film um along the way so post was it's real post is so tough on a low budget film because it's the time when you would really love to just take your time with it um did you find it tough yeah yeah so demanding yeah. and you're away from the closeness of the community that you have when you're making the film itself. So, um, but it's very, very straightforward, the post pro process in New Zealand on New Zealand features. You know, usually it's 12 week director's cut, um, X amount um, to lock. We had a two, oh, we had two weeks in the mix, one week pre-mix, one week of mixing. So gruelling, I don't know if, um, how if anyone knows just how gruelling that is but um yeah there was just really never enough time but weirdly you know it is what it is there's always the time that you have is the time that you have and you find a way to make it work yeah hmm. okay we had another question yes uh, when you were first read the book and uh, was there enough in the story so that it was uh very cinematic or did you have to take some license to deviate just to make it more, um, give it more or make it more visual or to make the characters deeper or uh, jump off the page? So I'll just repeat the question for those listening in at home. Uh, the question was when you first read the book, did you find that it presented a cinematic or did you find as filmmakers you had to take some licenses? Um, what was that experience like? Um, it's definitely cinematic and it's definitely a book that you read and you think how um, you, you do, you, you sort of see the film, you know, you read some books, you see the film and it has momentum which is really important, even though often the momentum is um, it's informed by flashbacks. So the film sits in the now but what's happening in the now is informed by past events. Um, I guess we had to take poetic license, we had to take license with it because there was too much in the book and so that required um, distilling 
uh, the story and I knew early on, I think I may have mentioned this, um, I had been privy to the um, Meta to Meta and Patricia Grace talking about the challenges of their adaptation and their, their challenges that, that there were too many characters and um, too many places and locations and story threads. So early on I um, was quite brutal when I was writing the script. Um, maybe put, joined two characters together in one instance, um, took out storylines, all of that stuff. So we, we definitely did, and, and just trying to get that really, uh, some kind of narrative back, backbone going um, meant, meant that amping up certain situations, etc. Um, and some of the story, um, because, um, and when you'll see it, you'll realise that there are many characters, and there are, three of each main character, so there are kind of nine leads. Uh, so it takes a little bit to, once you're in it, it's fine, but it takes a little bit to get a hold of the story. Um, we realised that there was possibly one too many storylines at one point, it just branched off and we had shot, we had shot a whole other location and brought in other characters, true to the book. Um, when we watched the film, it, mud it muddied the narrative a bit, so that ended up, we ended up losing that very sadly. There was nothing wrong with what we shot, it just, um, it confused the story a little and we, we didn't need any more of that, we needed people to be able to understand mm. it. We needed clarity more than anything. Mm. Mm. I feel like that leads well to one of these questions that we've got here from Jackie, which is, what makes Māori storytelling so unique? I think Briar's already sort of described it in terms of that spiralic, um, <laughs> spiralic storytelling. I think it's, I mean, you know, one of the things I'm thinking about a lot is it, it's actually hard to know about what makes our storytelling so unique because our storytelling exists um, hundreds and hundreds of years before colonisation and so it's in our bones and it's in our genes but we're actually having to reimagine it because through the, the process of colonisation we've kind of lost it to an extent but it is those things, it serves, it's, it serves the community. Um, I think that's one of the biggest things is that um, Māori storytelling and probably indigenous storytelling um, often is underpinned by um, the desire to uphold the values of the community. I think we talk a lot about cinema you feel, it's about capturing emotion and values and it's not so much about the story, it's about um, Barry Barclay, who was one of our um, foremost Māori documentarians, talked about um, the um, essentially the the central metaphor or the um, the the heart of the metaphor of the story that um, you know. And I'm sure you could apply these to storytelling in general, but uh, we, it also the other kind of catchphrase we've used a lot is it's connection based. So the three act or five act structure is a conflict based structure. Um, how we um, deal with conflict in order to reach our goal, it's quite individ individualistic um, and that's probably the best way I can describe Māori and I think there are similarities between many indigenous cultures that it's connection based. How are we connected? How are we related to each other? Mm. Mm. So um, I'll ask my own question here, <laughs> be a bit cheeky, but something that um, really struck me about the film, and you just brought it to mind, Ainsley, when you were talking about, although we're from these ancient bloodlines and we carry that story within ourselves, we also have to work through and unpack the fact that we exist um, in colonies under colonisation at the moment. So um, something that I noticed with the film was that although trauma and trauma relating to colonisation is within the film, it sits on the periphery and central to the storying is the connection. How intentional was that and is that true to the book for those who haven't read the book or was that something that you were taking licence with for the film? I think it's central to the book. I think Patricia is um, 
incredibly loving and kind to her characters and I think that's potentially what you're describing is that when we're looking at these characters we are looking at them with with love and yes we see the trauma that they've been affected by yes we see the loss and the disconnection and that sort of thing but ultimately like you do with most people do with family is you see everything you love about them and so I think absolutely that was that was in the book from the beginning. Do, is that how yeah, you? Yeah absolutely. Um, Patricia grew up a, around a very warm loving extended Fano, so she didn't experience anything really negative so she writes about she talks about writing about what she knows mm. um, and you know we have gone through this thing at home where we have uh, the I guess the what's the word I want to use it's a pretty basic word <laughs> well what the image the images <laughs> something what we've seen portrayed on screen particularly of, of Maori men for a very long time has been this kind of angry kind of warrior type and um, those are not men that we necessarily experience um, that much. The stereotype keeps getting perpetuated because it's proven to be successful in terms of people want to see that. But you know, we have to make a. I believe we have to be a little bit more responsible, responsible as filmmakers, and um, give the world other versions, other authentic versions of our of ourselves and of our men. And I think Patricia actually in her book, she is very good at this. I remember she's like a silent assassin. She actually is very good at, at with delivering a political message. Mm. It's, it's threaded all the way through, exactly as it is in the yeah. film. It's just here mm. all the time because we're all super, super aware of, of our histories and our whakapapa, our genealogy and how we get to this point and everything that's happened before us. So... Yeah, actually, all of that, all of that texture is definitely, definitely in the framework of her novel. Brilliant novel. It is yeah. a wonderful novel. Yeah. I cannot wait to read it. It is on my post PhD list of things I'm going to do. <laughs> um, well, that brings us to the end of our evening. So a huge thank you to Byron Ainsley and congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations on a truly magnificent film. Thanks to Afters, Acme, Film Victoria and Media Mentors for supporting Meet the Creators. And thank you for watching. Yellow and good night. <laughs>